frozen. Oh, good. All right, am I still frozen? Yep. Yep. All right. All right, guys, welcome back to night two of Science of Diving, one of my favorite courses to teach. Last week, we went over quite a bit. Um, and uh, you guys got the high, most high-level science of diving I've probably taught in a long time, closer to an intro to tech. So congratulations on that. And and uh, as David would attest that you guys were really – he watched uh, the recording, and, and that was his comment as well, as you guys were really on top. But so congratulations. Good job. Um, did everybody get my email today in reference to teaching? Yes. Yes. All right. All right. Are we pre- – are those who have asked to teach tonight prepared to teach? Sure. Fantastic. All right. I will so, give them a shot. <coughs> that's all I can ask. All right. So for tonight, uh, what I'd like to do is just a quick review of what we talked about before. In a previous uh, conversation, we uh, we covered uh, basically what physics are um, and how they work. We asked some basic questions of, of what that looks like and how the atmospheric pressures work. We talked about hydrostatic pressure atmospheric pressure um, and uh, gauge pressure. And we gave a basic idea of the three. So let's just review that. Josh, how would you describe hydrostatic pressure? Hydrostatic pressure, it's the pressure that the water puts on you, isn't it? Absolutely. So in that same line, Brian, what would be uh, absolute pressure? So absolute pressure then is going to be uh, the weight of the water plus the weight of the atmosphere above that. So that would be the total pressure you'd be feeling. Absolutely. The overall pressure. Absolute pressure, like it sounds, is the absolute pressure of everything around us, right? So absolutely. So I asked you guys to remember two numbers. What is the pounds per square foot that fresh water exerts? Chase, you got that one for me? 0.445 pounds per foot, linear foot. On fresh, uh, fresh water, that's salt water. So, oh, sorry, 0.432. Exactly. So 432 and 445, I encourage you guys, tattoo it on your wrist. Um, you will be asked that question a lot as time goes by. Um, let's see. We didn't talk about temperature too much. Let's see. Uh, we talked about Boyle's Law to ad nauseum. I think we pretty much got Boyle's Law. But who wants to tell me basically what is Boyle's Law? Jace, you want to take a stab at that one? Sure. Boyle's law is the relationship that pressure and volume of one cylinder will equal pressure and vol- volume of the second cylinder uh, as long as uh, only one of those variables changes. So it's basically the relationship, relationship that P1V1 equals P2V2. If I increase the pressure but keep the volume the same, uh, 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 I'm sorry, if I increase the volume, um, the, the pressure is going to go up. So it's the relationship between your pressure and your volume. That, okay. I, I butchered that. That was a horrible explanation, but it's P1V1 equals P2V2. It is. Let's, let's, let's simplify that down. As pressure increases, volume decreases at a constant temperature. As yes. pressure decreases, volume increases. That is the absolute simplest definition you can possibly give is as pressure increases, volume decreases. It's pretty straightforward, right? Um, so that's all we all really need to look look at. Now, Gay Lussek uh, takes that same basic idea, but it relates it in a different way. Mike, how does Gay, Gay Lussek um, relate boils, but just in a, from a different point of view, in my at least my opinion? Um, it takes temperature into account. It all does. Right. Um, it, it creates pressure re- relation to temperature. So as yeah. temperature increases, volume increases, right? As pressure temperature decreases, everything gets compressed and it's less. So absolutely, yep. you guys are doing great. And we talked about nitrogen becoming narcotic. About what point does nitrogen start to become narcotic? I believe that was a partial pressure of 2.37. Yep. Just after that, yep, you got that. And we'll get into that one a little bit more as well. All righty. So simply stated, if I had, and I'm using the idea of Kool-Aid crystals in water, and they stir them faster, the, the faster it mixes. 
uh, the more we mix, the more concentrated it becomes. Now, side note that um, this also uh, dissolves more quickly when it's cold. So what's the what law was relation to gas dissolving in a liquid? Who's Henry's our, law. Henry's law. Who said that? Mike. Nice. Good job. All right. I feel like you guys did a good job here. I'm, I am sufficiently impressed. <coughs> All right, and who wants to uh, take a stab at best gas mix for a 125-foot dive? One hundred and twenty what? One hundred and twenty foot? One hundred and twenty-five. Twenty-nine percent. Twenty-nine percent. Who said it? I agree. Twenty. What you going with, Chase? I agree. Brian, do you agree? I agree. Doctor, do you concur? Do you concur, Doctor? Do you concur? <laughs> for all of you, seeing catch me if you can. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> what is the mod for 40 percent nitrox? Eighty-two and a half. That's exactly right. Good job, Josh. Does everybody agree? You should agree because it's right. All right, good job, guys. You guys, um, the great thing is, is those the couple formulas we talked about and the information we provided um, is really a, a lot of a lot more advanced than you might thought you were going to get into. But you guys have done a fantastic job, and a lot of this is really more of an intro to tech. I'll be really honest with you. And, and the way I teach this is usually a, a light intro to tech, but I feel like we, we're kind of dumping in a little bit more of the deep end, and you're getting a more of a, a true intro to tech. Um, which is good because the problem with most science of diving is they teach you the what, but never the why. And the why is really when you start getting in the technical aspects of understanding what you're going to do with this stuff. So where I kind of ended on uh, Monday night was I wanted to jump a little bit into Pascal. <coughs> and I'm just going to jump over here. Jump over there. All right. So Pascal. Pascal's law is one you don't we don't talk a lot about, but water pressure changes as a diver swims deeper into the sea. This principle of transmission of fluid pressure is the basis for Pascal's law. Now, mathematically, the change in pressure um, of an enclosed fluid is equally transmitted to all points in a fluid. Now, where we can kind of see this the most easily is when you can do a Cartesian diver. Anybody uh, ever played and done a Cartesian diver before? Yeah. It's kind of fun. I, I went ahead and I've got a nice little video for us on this. Hello, I'm Dr. Bruce Bernardo here in the Physics Lecture Demonstration Laboratory at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. <laughs> How can a submarine sink or rise? One way is to change the amount of water in the ballast tanks. But how does this cause sinking and rising? You can understand the behavior by considering a simple physics demonstration called a Cartesian diver. Here is our Cartesian diver apparatus. It is a flexible two-liter soda bottle with an inverted glass test tube inside. The test tube is open and it contains some air. The yellow tape around the glass and the cork in the top there is just so that it can be clearly seen in the classroom. The bottle is filled with water and is securely capped. 
There is enough air to make the test tube float. Without the air, it will sink. There are different ways that you can make the divers sink. One is by telekinesis, using your mind to move objects. This takes uh, effort and practice. So let me see if I can do it. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? That you do. While I did this, my hand was on the bottle. Can I sink it without my hand being on the bottle? Let me try. Nope, can't sink it. As far as I know, there's no scientifically documented evidence for telekinesis. I sank the diver before by squeezing the bottle. Unsqueezing the bottle causes the diver to rise to the top. The apparatus may have been discovered by René Descartes, but the first thorough and printed account was in 1648 by a contemporary of Descartes named Raffaello Maggiotti, who claimed to have discovered it. Maggiotti was a favorite student of Galileo. To understand the Cartesian diver, we first need to recognize something about fluids, which are liquids or gases. In gravity, a body experiences not only a downward gravitational force, but an upward force in addition. This force is called the buoyant force. The buoyant force occurs because the pressure in the fluid increases with depth due to a greater amount of fluid that is supported above. For example, if you go deep enough in a pool, your ears will hurt due to this increased pressure. The pressure increase causes the upward force on the bottom of the body to be greater than the downward force on the top. The net effect is an upward buoyant force. The buoyant force is quantitatively given by Archimedes' law. The buoyant force on a body in a fluid is the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. From Archimedes' law, the condition for sinking is easy to remember. Sinking occurs when the average density of the body, which is the total mass divided by the total volume, is greater than the density of the fluid, water in our case. Let me set up a very simple example. <coughs> I have a glass test tube That's it. full of water. So this is our body. Okay, and now I'm going to submerge it in water. Okay, if I release it, what's going to happen? The average density of the body is greater than the density of water because the density of glass is greater than the density of water, and it sinks. We can now explain the demonstration. Look carefully at the air in the test tube. When I squeeze the bottle, you'll notice that water comes into the test tube and compresses the air. The water is incompressible here. What compresses is the air. Let's consider the diver to be the glass, the air, and the water inside the diver. The volume of the diver is, a, is constant. But when I squeeze the bottle, water enters the test tube. So the average density goes up. Once that average density is greater than the density of water, it sinks by Archimedes' law. In submarines, the ballast tanks are used to increase or decrease the mass while the volume is held constant, just as we have seen with the Cartesian diver. Pumping enough water into the ballast tanks can cause sinking, and pumping enough water out of these tanks can cause rising. The Cartesian diver is an old, popular physics demonstration and toy. The apparatus is simple, and you can make one at home. 
Googling Cartesian Diver yields tens of thousands of results. There are also many discussions on it in educational and scientific journals. Physics lecture demonstrations are always fascinating, and the quest for them never ends. This is the physics department of the Naval Postgraduate School, and I'm Dr. Bruce DeMondo. Now, my question to you guys is, who who said they'd seen it? I mean, if you were a sub, I'm sure you must have seen the Cartesian Diver, right? Caleb, you were a sub. Have you seen the Cartesian Diver before? Sorry, I've never done subs, but I have seen it. Okay. Do you have anything? It, it, it brings up a lot of thoughts on what's going on with us. So uh, a few thoughts as we kind of go through this process. Um, the first one is is the uh, Pascal's effect is one of the reasons that for what we call the magnetic depth uh, of uh, diving. There's there's a almost a feeling of magnetism when you start getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, that you start feeling the depth pull you down. You need a little bit more gas in your BC to make sure you're pulling and keeping yourself above above um, from just crashing in and right and so the deeper you go and and I've, so I've seen this happen I'm, you know on a big wall in, in Hawaii we were about 145 feet 140 feet whatever it was but we were still 300 more feet above the bottom <coughs> and it was interesting as we were going along it was very easy to get deeper and deeper and deeper and if felt almost as if the bottom was magnetic, right? And so you'll hear divers talk about the magnetic grip of the dark, uh, the magnetic grip of, of the deep, right? And it's it's a pretty common thing we ha that has happened. But it's based based upon Pascal's idea. The, the idea is, is what happens is wetsuits, dry suits, whatever, um, they get into this deeper, deeper compression, right? And they, they become less and less buoyant as we go along. And so it's something we need to be very cognitive of as we're diving to make sure that Pascal's effect is not becoming a problem. Now, one of the interesting places that uh, you we really start running into problems that we've seen is in the Red Sea. Um, there is a um, the most dangerous, and you can certainly look this up on YouTube. There's a bunch of videos on it. The most dangerous dive site in the world is in the Red Sea, and it's called uh, the Blue Hole, the Red Sea Blue Hole. And it's there's a um, people divers dive into this, and it's about 450 feet um, down. But there's a um, a channel that you can dive down to about 135 feet. You can dive through it and end up in the open ocean. Right? Only extremely advanced divers can do this on a single tank and you're pretty much retarded if you want to try and do it on a single tank either way now a number of years ago they were um there was a diver that went out that was trying to shoot a video of this and he he was not tech certified which was the first problem and he wanted to get a, a video of going to do this big dive um and uh, he kept uh, trying to find somebody who would um let him do this dive and and nobody would do it so he took a single tank out and he started going down and he started going down and he and they have this all on video and the problem was he got down to 150 feet and, and you could tell uh, as you watch his video that he started getting narcosis because he didn't understand using mixed gas and the correct correct gas <coughs> so he started going deeper the problem is he got to around 210 feet 230 feet and the magnetic depth took hold he became heavier and less buoyant himself to the point that his BC no longer had the lift capacity to be able to get him out of the blue, out of the, the hole. He literally got sucked in by the magnetism. So it was Pascal's effect that kicked in. So it's definitely something to be aware of is as you start doing these deeper dives, do you have the buoyancy characteristics to be able to handle that all the way through the dive? And generally, you guys should. I mean, if you're going to dive correctly, you're going to dive these deep dives, you get down to 200 feet, you should be diving something with sufficient enough. But realize, as you get down, you will get heavier. And so you need to be kind of aware of that. So, um, Is there a formula for that, Ben? There is not. It's, it's one of the least studied, kind of, uh, studied pieces of, out there. It's one of the things to make sure, though, that you have sufficient lift capacity. It, unlike the... 45 pound diver in the wetsuit out at Ryrie the other day. That was just ridiculous. You need to make sure that you're, you can strongly float um, with whatever gear you have. So for example, in my twin set uh, 100s, 
uh, Twin 100s. Uh, I know what their weight capacity is in uh, their negative 18 pounds, and I have a seven pound um, uh, plate on them as well. So I know that with that, that I'm diving negative what? 25 pounds, right? Um, add another five pounds for gear. That's 30 pounds that I'm diving. So with Twin 100s, I dive a, a, a 50 pound lift um, wet or uh, uh, wing with that, and then I generally dive a dry suit as well, which gives me ex extra lift capacity as well. But I make sure to have a sufficient amount of of lift above and beyond that. Uh, I was just saw um, a guy the other day was selling Twin um, 149 steel HPs, um, and uh, one of the things he made sure to put on there is that he had a twin 149s i kid you not but um he was smart on this and he made sure that he was he advertised he was selling them with his 100 pound lift um wing <coughs> so you want to make sure that as you go through the process that you're putting enough lift that you can get get yourself out of a situation and you're being careful of of waiting as well so just kind of something to think about so overall the big thing to realize with pascal is that um each of the dissolved gases, Pascal's principles, uh, pressures apply to fluids equally, and they transmit in all directions to all parts of the fluid equally. That's one of the, one of the interesting things is, is that it affects everything equally and at, at, um, equally as, as we go across. Now, you think toothpaste, you know, we've got a toothpaste tube. Um, is that a good example of Pascal with us squeezing the toothpaste? No. Not really. Yeah, it's, it's going from one direction, right? So as we think about that, just realize that it distributes the force in all direction, like brake, like brake fluid. It's hydro, uh, hydraulic, right? It's it's equal pressure across all points of it. So as we think about it, you, you know, think you put your hand straight out, um, you have uh, more air on top of your hand than under it. Do you feel the difference of the amount of air above and below? Below? No? Feels the same. If you go to the bottom of the pool, do you feel the weight of the, of, uh, the water pushing you down or, or straight up? No. Nope. No. And same thing. If you go to 900 feet, 300 meters in the ocean, does it feel the same? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's That's the idea of Pascal, is that Pascal says that um, the water is going to squeeze in all directions, not just from the top, not from the sides, but in all directions equally. So that's, that's the big thing to kind of understand about Pascal um, and understanding that it affects you whether you like it or not. That's the great thing with physics is they affect you whether you like it or not. It's your under, um, your responsibility to a, understand them. And then in some cases, use them to your advantage if you can. <coughs> hmm, excuse me. I'm still recovering. I apologize, guys. I don't mean to cough in your ear. All right. So cylinder values. Let's talk about this and, and uh, overall. So the interesting thing with cylinder values is that we, we have a, a working pressure. Um, for HP 80 is 237 bar and HP 100 is 237 bar, right? HP 120, 117, 133, they're all 237 bar, right? Which is about what? Anybody want to give me that in PSI? 3,000. About 3,000. 3,500. Yes, 3,500. <laughs> so, um, so it's about um, 0 0.06894 is a magic number. You want to remember that's your conversion rate for multiplication or division. So interesting enough, there's a reason for that. And we're going to get into the reason why we 237 bar is such a magic number. But here's the interesting thing about them is when we get into that, the pressure remains the same, but the liters or the cubic foot size is different. So, for example, an 80 cubic foot cylinder, that's an HP, by the way, is 10.2 liters. An HP 100 that I like, that's my favorite tank. Um, I love using the HP 100s uh, for a bunch of reasons. We can discuss that later. 12.9 um, liters. 15.3 liters for 100, uh, 120. 15 liters for a 117. 0.3 liters difference between three cubic feet, right? Um, and finally, a 133 is 17 liters. Now, the interesting thing is, as we kind of go through this, we start talking gas management i mean it kind of becomes obvious which one should we use if we want to use have the most amount of air or the longest dive more accurately which one should we use uh, would, would you rather use 100 or an 80 100 
Absolutely. Hundred. Absolutely. They hold the same pressure. What's the difference between the two? More volume. Points. Volume, yeah. If you've got it the same size cylinder, so like a, let's say it's a 50 cubic foot and the pressure, like one's a 3,000 and one's a 2,400, so you got a low pressure and a high pressure, the mm -hmm. volume's the same, right? Well, no, uh, that's, that's the interesting part is um, an LP80 and a, uh, or LP85 and an HP100 um, are the same liter size. So it's based upon their rating um, on that as well. So you want to know, you want to go back to the uh, manufacturer and find out what their actual liquid volume liter is. So um, an LP95 and an HP120 are the same size um, liter wise. Um, Does the and, five and the 110 represent cubic feet though? Wouldn't that? Yes. Yes. That wouldn't translate in, that would be, that wouldn't be the same in liters. It comes out in liters because of the pressure. The pressure is different. So an LP95 has a different pressure than an HP120. So they um, so they go by that. So interesting enough, as we kind of go through this, one of my biggest problems with SSI as it goes through the process is they give you um, and they say, I need you to take and go do a 20 minute dive for 20 minutes. And that's going to figure out your sack rate. What happens when one of you guys um, takes an open water class from Idaho Dive Pirates or Stewart Scuba, which are two of the best dive shops on the planet, by the way, um, or Tanked in uh, Honduras, um, another fantastic uh, um, dive facility. Those are my uh, or uh, and uh, and second would be you know like uh, I don't know uh, Spruce uh, Creek Scuba um, in Florida. Um, these are all court places I either I have personal relationship with, right? So all these, these places, they all use 80 cubic foot tanks. Now, all of a sudden, you go to some random island in Palau, and all they have is LP85s. What's going to happen to your sack rate? My sack rate? Yeah. More based sack on the SSI method. Why would my sack rate? <laughs> based on the the i mean my consumption okay so well my my consumption rate shouldn't change that's a physiological parameter of, of who i am but i'm going to deplete my tank at a different rate based exactly on is that what you're but, asking exactly and you you've okay. got it exactly on the idea so here's the thing is all of a sudden you you spend you know the next three weeks in palau diving and all of a sudden, because you're using LP85s, your sack rate has gone way down, right? You yeah. decide to come back to Idaho, and you're going to do a tech dive, and you, you're going to use that new sack rate on these uh, aluminum 80s. You're going to be screwed, right? Because yeah. they don't match up. It's not. It's like trying to compare, say, the gas mileage for my three-quarter ton truck going downhill is the same as my three-quarter ton truck going uphill, right? It's it's different ideas, right? And while that's that doesn't do a direct translation, um, it's it's about as or comparing the the uh, sack or the uh, saying I went I went to Honduras and I rented a Hyundai Elantra and it got 22 miles the gallon. I should be able to come home and get 22 miles the gallon in my truck because that's how I drive, right? It does, there's a better a better comparison, more apples to apples, right? So the thing we have to do is we have to start figuring out the idea that our sack rate doesn't change, but the equipment we do, we're using does. So my question for you guys, and under gas management, which one of these contain, contains more liters of usable gas? An aluminum 80 at 3,000 PSI or an HP 100 with 2,600 pounds of gas in it? Can that be the HP 100 at 2,600 PSI? Okay, so we got one for HP 100. Who else says HP 100? Uh, I'm going to say the HP 100. Okay, I got two for HP 100. HP 100. Got three for the HP 100. <coughs> you got more atmospheres of gas packed into that HP 100 than you did the AL80. Uh, the AL80. Okay, so is pretty much everybody um, on board with the HP 100 is more? I mean, I'm not going to go against the grain here, but I'm still trying to do the math. <laughs> well, let's take a look at it. 
I just, no, I just yes. happen to have a chart here. So here's <laughs> aluminum 80 is in this column. HP 100 is column two. So let's go down. 3,000 right here on the aluminum 80 is 79 cubic feet of air. Mm -hmm. And HP 100 at 2,600 mm -hmm. is 82 cubic feet of air. Almost the same? No. Two cubic feet of air is not a lot higher. No. Yeah. One slightly higher. So you guys are right that the HP 100 was more, but are you surprised by how little the difference really was? Hmm. Yeah. So let's figure out how to come up with that, um, how we can figure out what the usable gas is. And, and one of the things I want you guys to start thinking is metric. It's going to make your guys' life so much easier. <laughs> now, how we do this is really simple. First off, we have to know what the tank size is in liter and what our bar is. If we multiply those two out, it'll give us the total liters of breathable gas. Now, to convert bar, PSI to bar is 0.06894. It's a number, if it were me, and it was me, uh, I would memorize it, and this would be one of the numbers I would tattoo on my wrist. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So, if you guys would like, I will happily send you over. I have a spreadsheet that has every tank just about. It's probably, probably not, I shouldn't say every tank, probably 90% of tanks that you will ever see in your lifetime on it. Um, this is some just screenshots I pulled. For example, if you use a Catalina 30, I showed you one of those the other day. At three, it's a 3,000 psi tank. It's 4.3 liters, 30 cubic feet. Here's its length, and as well as here's its buoyancy factor. It starts out negative two and a half, 2.4, and ends at empty at negative 0.2. Uh, um, here's a Catalina 40. I've got one of those in the background here. Um, here's a Faber 40. Um, that's a steel HP. Um, and we can continue, continue down. An aluminum 80, uh, Catalina, an, S, an S80, is 11.1 .1 liters. So we're going to use that for right now. 11.1 .1 liters. So who's got their thinking caps on? Do, we, do you guys need me to bring that uh, formula back up for you guys? Or are you guys good to go? Was that 0 0.68, 0 0.0684? Exactly. Okay. Let's go back over here. So if I have a scuba tank and it is an aluminum 80, which has 11.1 .1 liters in it, and I fill that up to 2,900 PSI, how many liters of gas do I have? How much PSI again? 2,900 PSI. How many liters of gas do I have in that tank? 2,218. I have 19, but close yeah, enough. 19. If you, yeah, if you so use all the decimals out, it comes out to 19. But I'm not going to equivalent yep. over a lead, one liter of gas, considering the average. You guys, I would guess, on average, are breathing about 15 mm -hmm. to 17 liters per minute on your dives, would be my guess. Somebody like David, he's like 40 liters a minute, but that's just David. He's no, David's got a good sack rate. I'm just, I'm giving David a hard time. He knows that. At, what were you last time we were talked? Uh, 13 or 14? Uh, it's been a minute since I've calculated, but I, I think I'm usually like 12 to 16. Yeah, sounds about right. So on the, I was looking at like LP 50, so two low pressure 50s, and they said they were 7.9 liters. Um, and then an HP 100 was 12.9. So would those two LP 50s have more usable liters than an HP 100? Yes. 
if 7.9, that'd be 14, 15, yeah. It's it's screwy. It really is. It comes up to, to liquid volume, but absolutely. Yeah. I was struggling to understand why that would be the case. It's goofy. Um, if you guys want, I, here, I'll, I'll go ahead and share screen real quick. Uh, take me a second. You guys are welcome to this. Uh, I just would like to make sure I give you a class on the the key piece of this because when you guys see my extended range gas planning um, sheet, um, it might be a little overwhelming. No. So this is my extended range gas planning sheet. Yes. Um, this is how I plan my gas. Uh, I can do it by hand, absolutely. Um, but I went ahead and created a spreadsheet based upon what I needed. Um, just to make my life a little easier. Um, but in this same sh uh, spreadsheet, I also happen to have this. This is just about every tank. Um, the 108 different tanks um, that you may come across. So yours was, what brand was your tank? You said it was a 40? You're talking about mine? Yeah, I was, I was looking at the LP fifty two low pressure fifties. Oh, okay. Versus one high pressure one hundred. Now, the challenge is, is you also have to do it based upon the maximum amount as well of gas that it can take. So, if it's an LP fifty, let's just find that real quick. Liters uh, cubic feet. Uh, we'll just we should have it on here. Let's see. Bet is it an OMS or is it uh, a Faber? Faber. Okay, there it is, right there. Seven point eight, right there. Um, the OMS is, I think they're cast in the same place, but it's seven point eight liters. Yeah. But remember, your maximum gas uh, fill, unless you um, you set it over uh, and get a um, get an overpressure on it on your next next time you have it um, uh, hydroed and have yep. them put a star in it with a star, you can get it ten percent more but its max capacity is 2,600 um, mm -hmm. and 40 PSI. Whereas an HP is, is gonna be a lot more. So in the but end- the, you're gonna, Is the usable volume there is, is more, it, it sounds like, in liters? It is, it, so it, it, it's gonna come out probably about the same. Let's do the math on it. So we have 7.8 times 2 equals 15.6. So we'll take it over. So we're just we're going to cheat a little bit here. So if we have 14, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm having a brain aneurysm today, 15.6 at uh, 2460. PSI should give us. Uh, 2,646 liters of gas. We have a hundred. Let's see. Da, 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 type data, a hundred. Uh, 17. Just want, just checking myself here. 100, 12.9. Uh, um, 12.9. 120.9, that'd be a lot at 3,500 PSI. So interesting enough, even though, uh, here's where it kicks in is the pressure. So a, a 100 cubic foot tank is gonna have 3,100 liters of gas, whereas two LPs, low pressures, with that reduced pressure in it, are gonna have 2,646. Right. So the HP 100 will have more gas, where the the smaller 50s will have more volume because the HPs um, are high pressure. They'll carry more gas. So you get about 500 pounds more gas in that. So definitely what do you the math. What's the pressure rating on these tanks? The LPs, 2640 or 2460, I'm sorry. The hydrostatic test pressure of these tanks. The hydrostatic, well, they test them at twice the, uh, um, the standard pressure of it. So if it's so you, if it's get them, for, if you get them filled in an ice bath, you can you can utilize Gala Sachs law to get in even more pressure in them. You can, um, and there's a lot of places that do fill fill them um, the, um, at normal pressure. But simply enough, when you do 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 your fill tank fills, as Josh will tell you, when you do your your first tank fill, it gets hot. 
you stop, yeah. you let it cool for a while. And, and a lot of times you do your, on a, especially on a steel tank, you do your second fill day two okay. um, to get it to correct pressure. To top uh, off. So you, yeah. So you get it to room, you're going to get it to room temperature okay. um, and to cool it down. And so it, all things being equal, temperatures aside, um, and air temperatures being equal across, um, a uh, two LP fifties will actually have less gas but more volume. And where it's really going to, um, Mike, re really going to trip you up is on tank data. So let's look at something else. So we had that LP fifty right here that weighs eighteen point nine pounds, and let's see. It is. Oh, there it is. Sorry. 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 And it is. Let's see. Uh, buoyancy full is negative two pounds. So it's negative two pounds in, uh, full and one pound positive at the end. Right. So let's go down and look at that HP 100 as well. Here's your HP 100. Your HP 100 weighs 34 pounds. 18.9 times two. So if they weigh about the same to, um, as well. And your buoyancy factor is um, eight pounds negative to start and negative half a pound empty. So the nice thing with an HP 100 is all, it'll carry 500 liters more gas It'll start out a lot more negative and it'll remain negative to the end of the dive. And plus you're just dealing with one tank. So. And one more thing about that. If you're dealing with two low pressure fifties, both of those are empty at 500 PSI, which means you're losing a thousand PSI over the 500 PSI empty of the single 100. Sure. Sort of overall. Yeah. It, it's, it definitely, so, you're losing more gas running too, but you have a redundancy. But yeah, it, right. point taken. It's, it's not quite that, but you're you're on the right track. Yeah. <coughs> Anybody start the branching part, to, to like carbon fiber or synthetic materials for tanks? Um, they they have been playing with carbon fiber, um, and uh, there's there's not many out there. The problem with carbon fiber is it wears out, um, it expands and contracts, and it's not as durable as aluminum or steel. Okay. Um, so you won't see a lot of people out there that use them, just simply for the fact they're just not as durable. But overall. Yeah. That gives you Isn't a good that idea. What they made that sub out of? I'm sorry, say again. Isn't that what they made was, that submarine out of? It was titanium. That was, different, that was different because they went from a carb they went from a carbon fiber interface to titanium, which is notoriously difficult. So whereas okay. a tank is basically sure. comes up to a bottleneck, they they installed windows on the submarine and getting that mating surface is unbelievably hard from an engineering standpoint. Yeah. So they said to hell with the regulators, and uh, lo and behold, uh, eight billionaires died. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we also spent a few that. million dollars trying to rescue them. Yeah. Well, it was a good training yeah. exercise for the Navy, though. Uh, <laughs> that. But there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's jump back on kind of the topic, though. But this gives you kind of an idea. This is the first part of figuring out sac is sac rate is also making sure that all the data across the board is even. Right. If we're not making sure to use the correct data across the board, we can't be accurate across. So the first thing we need to understand is what are we breathing out of? What's what's the what are we working against? And um, understanding what our tank volume is in liters makes our life a ton easier. Also, what's our fill pressure as well? So, for example, you can get those little Faber 40s. Um, they're kind of a pain in the ass and not my favorite is um, they're just heavy little turds um, and hard to hard to manipulate they'd be cute in twin sets though um but um making sure you understand what you're breathing off of so that that takes us to our next thing um air usage and supply so surface air consumption rate the formula to find out find this out is generally sac rate divide da, 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 da. i'm telling you right now this is what's in the book if you had paper books, um, I would do a, a, a Dead Poet Society and have you rip that page out, throw it away, and, and um, shred it um, because it's the most worthless page ever. Let's determine our sac rate the right way, and, a lot, and let's do it a lot more easily. The way to do that is, first thing, what I want you guys to do is you get a tank, a regulator, a mask. Sit in a normal position at the surface. My suggestion, you guys have all heard me say this, in your living room, turn Big Bang Theory on, mark down the beginning pressure 
uh, prior to starting. Put the regulator in your mouth and breathe normally for 20 minutes. Measure the volume in PSI at the end. Divide by the total minutes and repeat this three times. By doing that, you're going to get an accurate sac rate because where should we make uh, where should we measure our sac rate? The surface. Well, yeah, yeah, it's right in the name. It's kind of like Custer's white horse. I think you guys all heard me say this at least once or twice. Mike, you haven't heard me say this, but um, I'm kind of a smart aleck in my classes. I apologize. <laughs> but if you're going to measure your sac rate, it should be done exactly as it says at the surface. Is your surface air consumption rate? Now, the nice thing is, guys, your surface air consumption rate shouldn't change. It's based upon your physical features, your size, the size of your lungs, how in shape you are. The basics of that don't change. And if they do change, it's because you went to the gym and went and started Nutrisystem and, and it took you six months to drop the 300 pounds that you gained from eating donuts all day long out of the site. Right, Brian? <laughs> I think it'd also be fair to say that if we packed up and went to, say, Cozumel or anywhere by the ocean, where we're dropping in 5,000 feet, we could expect our sack rate to decrease a little bit too. Because we're acting absolutely, at absolutely. Feet. Well, I can tell you that um, uh, before Nikki and I got married, I was running a, a quite, I was running a lot. I was putting in somewhere around 60 miles a week um, on the road running, uh, 30 to 60 miles, depending. And uh, my, my five mile and 10 mile times dropped dramatically when I would go to Florida to visit my daughter. It was awesome. I thought I was a, I thought I was Elliot Kachobi um, when I get to Florida. It was awesome. But, Overall, it's not going to change by all that much. This will at least give you a base a base number to get you to. So here's how it looks. If we had a starting PSI um, on our tank at 3,000 PSI, and we ended at the end of 20 minutes of 2,500 PSI, we used 500 PSI. So simply enough, take that 500 PSI and multiply it by 0.06894 equals 34.47 bars used. Now we know we can take that 80 cubic foot aluminum cylinder and we can – uh, which is 11 liters, and we can multiply. And I did 11, meter, 11 liters intentionally because it was just an even easy number for you guys. So we can multiply 11 liter tank by 34.47 bar means we used 397 bar or 307 liters. I'm sorry. Now, all we need to do is take 397 divided by 20 equals 19.85 liters per minute sac rate. Now, for the love of God, none of you guys should be using 19 liters a minute sitting watching big bang unless it was a really really funny episode josh and i had this conversation before we're gonna start rating uh um big bang theories based upon the amount of gas you go through a really yeah, good based episode. on student sac rates yes based on student sac rates absolutely which episode was that you went you were this okay <laughs> now i want to see you, all three of them <laughs> will so, your sac rate change if you're breathing a different composition of gas like yes. if you your oxygen or, or a higher oxygen concentrate will lower your sac rate. Your metabolic yes. energy will go down. It, it, for, for a couple of reasons. One of them is exactly that because of medical, metabolic and, uh, uptake. So if you're breathing a higher percent of oxygen, um, you're oxygenating more easily. Um, absolutely. Um, the other thing to be aware of is different gases have different weights as well. Um, so they, they reduce the RMV, the, the work of breathing as well. But overall, the change in sac rate is negligible and it's not something we generally worry too much about. So, um, because it is fairly negligible, it will change, but not enough to, to really set out and, and cause an issue. It's so also ben, part I, of the reason. Go ahead. If, if, if you calculate your static resting sac rate, realistically, mm -hmm. unless we're doing a safety stop or a deco stop, we're not really static in the water. We're applying some degree of work or effort. What work or effort uh, factor would you apply to that sac rate? I am so glad you asked, Chase, because that is absolutely coming up. Um, okay. And uh, so as we go through this, understanding sac rate based upon effort happened to be the next slide. <laughs> so a light dive, very low effort, is going to be a 1.1 to 1.5 multiple. A median effort is going to be a two to two and a half, and a heavy effort could be three to four, up to six, really. So a, a typical dive factor for an easy wetsuit dive in the, in the tropics with good visibility, minimal current is going to be a 1.2. That's a typical for me. A dive in cold water wearing a dry suit, carrying a camera, working against a current, um, a little stressed because the hammerheads are in the water, could, could have a dive factor of three or more. 
So it's hmm. something you definitely need to take into consideration, the, the factor of the dive. Now, the, the multiple factors that we use are relatively subjective um, as well. Chase, your work factor certainly may be different than mine. Now, I, I need to, and you kind of preempted before I got to the slide. <coughs> the at most, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna back up one more, um, is as we go through this process, some of it's going to be experience as well, but by applying the, the beginning numbers of this to our dives, we're able to start giving ourselves at least a base point and saying, okay, this is what it looks like for me. And I can start measuring this across 10 dives or 15 dives or 20 dives. I generally like to measure mine across 10 dives that are of similar nature. So that when I go into something like this, I can tell you that most of my August dives in Ryrie are an effort of 1.8 is pretty typical. Now my effort in dives in Ryrie in December are more like a, a 2.5. Um, the cold definitely has a lot to do with it. It's a lot more work in the cold. Um, I'm shivering. I'm going through process like that as well. So I, I take into account the coldness of the water, the effort of getting in the water, the effort of the current, and I figure out what that looks like to me. So I'm able to edge out and create a, a sack rate based upon my dynamic. But this will at least get you in the ballpark so that you're able to start putting it together an idea. Now, this is one of the reasons that using a dive log is so imperative that you're able to go through and start putting in the information and saying, okay, because this, I was doing that. And because of that, I was doing this. And so I can start putting together the ideas of this is what's going on in my mind. Um, one of the other things I do as well is I also uh, measure out um, based upon what what gear I'm wearing. So for example, um, I, in my dive log, I have an ST35. I have my skeleton wing in there. I have my side mount rig in there. Um, I've got my teaching rig in there as well. And then I have my, my BPN wing uh, for twin sets. <coughs> so I can tell you, my sack rate running twin sets on my back is slightly different than running side mount. Side mount, I have a much lower sack rate. In fact, Nikki's got the lowest sack rate of, uh, of anybody I know in side mount, for example. I've seen her get as low as five liters a minute. And That's my awesome. sack rate is the lowest when I'm in side mount, for example. And it typically, um, on an easy, cold, colder dive, but not freezing dive, um, I'm usually somewhere in the six, uh, six liters to seven liters per minute on a, on a dive in side mount diving uh, two uh, side mount 100s. Now in a twin sets, I'm usually around eight to nine liters per minute in twin sets. So different configurations will cause you to work differently. It's a lot more effort to run twin sets on your back than it is to run side mount. A lot less effort. Um, I'm when a lot more, go ahead. It, it's less about the configuration though, right? And more about the effort that you're putting into whatever the dive is that would require that equipment? Some, some. Uh, that's that's an excellent uh, a note of, uh, note there, and it's um, absolutely because in side mount I'm a lot more streamlined. One kick for me in side mount is equal to everybody else's three kicks, so I don't work as much to move across the board. But I can tell you, putting twin sets on, if I'm if I'm out of kilter a little bit, I'm creating a lot more effort to keep them there. And the easiest way I can describe uh, diving side mount versus twin sets is kind of like this. With with uh, let me find a better one. Here we go. This is what diving back mount is like, is you're constantly working to keep that in balance, right? Overall, and sometimes it falls. In side mount, that's how you balance things. It, it's literally, since it's below you and it's in a different position, there's, not a, there's no effort involved, it's just there. Whereas with twin sets, you're constantly trying to keep that balance and keep it in at the same spot. So because of that, because your secondary muscles are engaged a lot more, um, you're working a lot more as well. Um, and it's a lot of it due to the weight and weight placement. So, and then getting those damn twin sets out of the water. Ugh. So fun story for you. We were, uh, Nikki and I were diving, uh, the crater in Yellowstone Lake and it is the longest shallow walk out of the water that you've ever seen. It's, it's literally 200, 300 yards, um, to the shore from the point where you hit about uh, belly level water, about three and a half, four feet of water is two to 300 yards from shore. So you, you're done swimming because you just can't. 
And so we came out of the water after an hour and a half, um, hour and 45 minute dive. And I had twin sets on and she was carrying side mount. And we were both just like, <sighs> and so I was carrying these and I carried it for the longest time. Finally, I just grabbed one of Nikki's tanks as well and, and clipped it and drug it for her. Cause she was just getting grouchy and mad cause she was so tired, but oh my God, carrying those dang twin sets was a freaking nightmare for 200 yards through shallow water. It was, yeah. it wasn't fun. I mean, so it's, it's definitely, it has a lot to do with that as well. But uh, anyway, uh, be aware that as you guys are doing this, once you get your base levels, then make sure you're taking into account all the different things. If you're wearing a wetsuit, if you're wearing a dry suit, if you're wearing a thin wetsuit, if it was a drift dive, if it was, um, if it was just a, a river, dive, if it was a river dive, river dives are, are notorious for sucking down, sucking your uh, gas rate down. So just be aware of that. So let's see, yeah, there we go. As we go through this process, there we go. So understanding sac rate, the first uh, step is to understand and multiply our sac rate by our target depth and atmospheres, and then convert that depth and atmospheres and divide by 10 um, and add one for metric or 33, divide by 33 and add one for imperial. So what it's gonna look like for you, it's a light effort dive, no current. We're diving a 117 cubic foot tank at 3000 PSI at 66 feet seawater, which is three atmospheres. <clears throat> and we figured out that our sac rate, based upon watching the Big Bang Theory and, and the average episodes, was uh, three, 14 liters per minute. How we do this? 117 liters cubic feet is 15 liters. So 3,000 PSI times 0.06894 is 206 bar. So simply enough, 206 bar times 15 liters equals 3,090 liters. Now, if we just count out two-thirds of that gas using our rule of thirds, we have 2,060 liters of usable gas. How we figure out our sac rate uh, for our coming up dive, 14 liters a minute times an, a medium effort uh, or a light effort of 1.5 equals 21 liters per minute of actual usage. Remember, we're gonna be at three atmospheres, so we'd multiply three atmospheres times our new 21 liters per minute equals 63 liters per minute at depth. Now. 63 meters, liters per minute divided by 2,060 liters means we'll have 33 minutes of actual dive time. That's how we uh, we come up with uh, um, the idea of um, uh, liters per, or our, our actual sac rate. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. just like the dive tables, let me flip back over here. Now, just like the dive tables, remember everything that we do with the dive tables is based upon a box profile. It's basically saying, if this were our dive, the 66 foot dive that we literally got off the boat, we dove straight down to 66 feet. We stayed at 66 feet for exactly um, uh, 33 minutes and we came back up directly, right? The nice thing with, uh, with our dive computers is, and or with SAC rate is that we're not gonna be at that 66 feet for the whole time, but if we plan our dive based upon the box profile, we should end up with an additional safety margin. Make sense, guys? So as we yes. start putting out and getting a basic idea that, okay, uh, Josh, Caleb, Chase, Brian, uh, David, and Mike and I, we're all gonna go out and we're gonna do a dive out at Rye. We're gonna dive to 120 feet uh, today and uh, Based upon our or our Brux profile at 120 feet at Ryrie, which is 0.84 out, uh, out barometric pressure, which means a theoretical depth of 139 feet, if we're, and we're going to stay down for uh, 40 minutes, right? We're not actually going to stay down for 40 minutes, but which means and if if we're using a 15.6, well, let's do a shorter time. Uh, let's do 25 minutes. There we go. I'm going to chip. Uh, put that back on my screen. Let's see, share this. Stop share, present, share screen, window. There we go. All right, so we're up here at the top. Let's just zoom in a little bit. Okay, so 120 foot depth. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna just put this back to theoretical depth or to bare bench pressure of one. So we're going down to 120 feet. We're spending 25 minutes there, which gives us a 25 minute run time, 20% oxygen, 15.6 liter tank, 2,400 or say 3,000 PSI to start with. 
sack rate of 15, work factor 1.5, which means at the end of it, we should have 564 PSI left. That's counting in that we're diving for 25 minutes at 125 feet. That's not talking sack, uh, descent times, safety stops, anything like that. And we all know that that's not how this works. That truthfully, we're going to do, say, 20 minutes at our first depth. And we're going to spend 10 minutes. In this case, we're probably going to come up to 90. And we're going to spend three minutes at 90, which gives us 23 minute run time, which means we're going to come up to 60 at three minutes. This is 26 minutes of run time, which gives us 30 or three minutes. It's a 29 minute run time, which gives us 20 for five minutes. Gives us a 34 minute run time. Okay. So <coughs> in that same idea, we've just calculated out a 34 minute dive and we're at the same point PSI wise. We're still at five, we're at 559 PSI, right? So you can really plan out your dives. And this is how you should plan out when you get into tech diving is the idea of what am I going to actually do? What's my dive time at depth actually going to be? Can I do a 20 minute dive at 120 feet? Where am I going to do my first stop? Where am I going to do my next stop? If you're just doing recreational diving, you may say, okay, I'm going to do a, uh, a 15 minute dive, which is 15 minute run time. And then I'm going to come up to 20 feet and I'm going to do my safety stop for, I'm going to go ahead and spend 10 minutes there. Zero, 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 and zero, 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 which means I get a 25 minute dive and I'm going to end at 1500 PSI. So you can plan them as accurate, as, as detailed as you want, but remember, you're probably not going to spend your, all your time, all that 120 minutes or, or 15 minutes at 125 feet or 120 feet. You're going to spend that out. So you can certainly gas manage and, and plan based upon your actual uh, process. It makes sense? Yep. Yep. So overall, that's that's uh, uh, how to look at that overall. And it comes down to understanding your tank. What tank am I, what am I diving? What's my actual sack rate? Now, the cool thing is I'm saying you guys are going to be 15 to 17. I know for me in side mount, I'm closer to eight. Does that make a little bit of a difference? Just a little. So you guys are 1500 PSI. I'm now at so 2200 PSI. And this is going to, you guys will see this on Saturday. When we go out and do our deep class, you guys will notice that I'll go through a third of the tanks you guys go through. It just, but I've also got a lot more dives. It happens. And one of the things you'll notice with time is your sack rate will decrease. Um, your F, which will actually, and your effort will actually decrease as well. Your secondary muscles, when it comes into into figuring out your sack rate, is an interesting thing. The less dives you have, the more secondary muscles will kick in and cause you to lose sack rate. Um, the more dives you have, the more your mind will relax and allow you to have better dives. A great example of this. <coughs> excuse me, guys. I was doing a dive, uh, a solo dive. I was, and I was geared for it, of course. Um, at 125 feet and I had all of a sudden I had the regulator ripped out of my mouth during the dive. My light went off at the exact same time. So all of a sudden, no light, 125 feet in a, in a lake, which meant it was pitch freaking black and no gas. It ripped out. Now, the cool thing is, is as this happens, not a big deal. I tried to, you know, I relaxed. I tried to pull my regulator. Nothing was happening and I couldn't see it. So I went ahead and I described my safety second, quick clear, looked down at my, uh, uh, tried to figure out what's going on with my light. And I reached over and grabbed my backup light, kicked it on. And I saw that my regulator got pulled out by a tree branch. I took it off the tree branch, expected it really quickly, took my safety second out, put my primary back in, gave it a quick clear, put my safety second away. Um, and uh, uh, everything was cool. Checked out my primary light. It was had a bezel turn um, on switch. And I just hadn't clicked it all the way around. I clicked it on just enough that it, it caused it to click off. So I clicked it back on, came right back on, put my safety my safety light away. All about that space, maybe maybe a minute and a half, maybe 90 seconds worth of work. All, and, and the thing is, is I practice this a lot because I teach. 
everything from open water through tech. So I practice these skills myself. So I'm good at these skills. Um, so as I, I get through this, this process, I relaxed. I went, in, went through the process of, uh, of continuing on. Now, typically, I'm about, at that time in my life, I was about 10 to 11 liters per minute um, on gas. And I, had, and I had a program on my watch where I could, I could do that. And I, I watched at the point, you can see in the, in the sac rate graph exactly where that happened. Because all of a sudden, I went from about 11 liters a minute to 40 liters a minute. And that sac rate stayed at that 40 liters a minute for several more minutes past the event. And then slowly, over the next 15 to 20 minutes, returned back to the 11 liters per minute. But it took probably 15 minutes. Now, what it changed, guys? I mean, if you got that ripped out of your mouth, you might have had, you know, a little bit of an adrenaline rush. And maybe that did exactly. something and it just took all the way out. The easy answer to that is what it changed. The prospect between my ears. Physically, I hadn't changed. There was no more effort to doing anything. And, and do, changing to a safety second is no, no big deal. I can do that in my sleep. I don't need I don't need to see anything to do that. Right. Everything that changed between my ears. So your mental outlook and your mental perception um, will definitely change your sac rate as well. So the more relaxed you guys get, um, the easier this process will be for you as well. So just be aware that it uh, um, <coughs> there's a lot of factors that go into sac rate. Mental state is absolutely one of them. Comfort level is one of them. Um, comfort in the equipment that you're diving is another one. Um, comfort in just diving is, a, is absolutely another one. So as we go through this process, realize that the science of figuring out the sac rate starts with a base number, but there's a lot of factors that hit outside of that. It's, this is one of the reasons that I really prefer um, to say, let's figure out our sac rate based upon surface and get the most accurate information we possibly can, and then utilize that in, a, in, a real, in real scenarios until we get to the point where we know that this is how we are as as divers that we keep going through the process and and refining this but at least if we start with accurate information as we refine the information uh, based upon us it's more accurate re accurate to refine it out you know statistics says very clearly that junk in junk out make sense guys mm -hmm. so let's do a couple of calculations just to make sure you guys got it uh, just to make sure everybody got their paper and pencil All right, so if I have an 11.1 .1 liter tank and it's got 2,700 PSI in it, how many liters of gas do I have? And how many liters will I have in reserve? Two thousand sixty six liters. With about thirty four in reserve. How many liters in reserve? We're still assuming 500 pounds for a reserve, right? You can certainly go to 500, uh, 500 pounds, or you could do rule of thirds. Yeah, so thirds is going to be like 681. Okay. You guys see how you got there? How, if I have a 15 liter per minute sac rate, how long will I be able to, if I use two thirds of that gas, how long can I dive? Sack rate of what? 15 liters per minute. 15. <laughs> Is there a depth component here or? Nope. We're just going to start with just uh, just this. 91 minutes. Yep, that's what I got. 
90.9. There you go. Simple enough. Okay. Next. I'm going to do a nice two foot dive. Foot dive. At a medium effort. Let's say 1.5. I've got. 3,214 PSI, and I'm going to dive a 12-liter tank. What's my sack rate at depth? Not enough information to figure out your sack rate. I don't know what your sack rate is on the surface. Is it 60? I thought you said 15. 15 liter per minute. Yeah. Okay. It's 16, 15 liter per 67 and a half. I got 67.5. Around that to four atmospheres. Oh, plus one. Yep. Yeah. And do you want that stack rate in PSI per minute or in liters per minute? Liters per minute, fine. The 90? Who's got it? 83.63. I got it. That would, would that be, are you multiplying by three atmospheres or four? This is my only question on that one. So here's how to do that. So 92 uh, divided by 33 is what? Roughly three, two point. Two point seven eight. Seven yep. eight. Repeating. Equals two point seven eight seven eight. Plus one for the surface <laughs> is three point seven eight seven eight. Yeah. There's our atm is that's what our atmospheric pressure is exactly. Let's see equals. There we go. So there's our actual atmospheric pressure right there. So now all we need to do is multiply that three point seven eight seven eight times fifteen equals what guys. 60, well, just shy of 60. 56. 56.817. 56, yep, 0. 0.8170. Now all we need to do is take that 56.8170 times 1.5. Oh, fuck. I've got to do that equals equals 85.2255 liters per minute that's my sack rate at depth have i lost anybody here or is everybody pretty much tracking what i'm putting down so you would do the i think originally when i got to the 90 calc i used four but i also um did the liters per I did the liters per minute calculation first at depth, so it was like sixty something. Does it matter which order? Nope. Order operations and multiplication should say that you should be able to multiply them all at the same in this in any order, right? Jace, you're our mathematician. Yeah, yeah. That, that's right. That's, that's what I did is transitive properties, I guess, not order of operations. Transitive properties. 
It says that I can I can multiply in any order. Yeah. And I can, I'll get the same number. So that was a little bit different and a little different thinking, but at least now you have your total liters per minute. Now, at this, how many liters are in my tank? I have a 12 liter tank. Usable liters. Time. How many liters are in my tank? So we got to figure out the bar, right? 20 liters. 3, 2, 1, 4. 20 liters. 3, 2, 1, 4. 32, 1, 4 times 0. 0.06894 equals 221.57. <laughs> so that's how many new calculator batteries I'll be right back. So, <laughs> 1. 1.5731 equals times 12 liters equals 2,658.8772. That's how many liters we have in our tank. And you can, you guys can always round. If you're going to round, I just round down. And I'm fine with that. I like to do it exact uh, to, to the number. That's just me, though. So 2658.8772. Uh, now divide that by my sack rate of 85. Where'd it go? Uh, yeah, 85.2255 equals, that'll tell us how many divided by 85.2255 equals 31 minutes. There you go. So there's the science of figuring out your sack rate. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, good news for, uh, let's see. Well, but that's that's right. including your reserve, right, Ben? You have thirty. That's including minutes. my reserve. That's I haven't uh, broken out and giving a reserve. That that takes me to zero. So I haven't even calculated out. So that's a good catch, Josh, and I'm, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm just saying that in this tank, you've got thirty-one minutes now. If I wanted to make sure I had reserve, I would want to make sure to subtract out either fifty bar times eleven. That's the total number of liters, right? Um, or one third of this. 20 minutes and 40 seconds. So I could literally, I should be able to take my transitive properties. I should be able to take 31, multiply it by 0.66 and say that I should be, I should have a dive. Yeah, 21 minutes. Yep. 20 minutes. I um, always round down dive time available of 20 minutes, which would give me 31 minutes of reserve or 11 minutes of reserve time. So now the good news is, is that reserve, I'm going to be ascending and I'm going to be going through a lot less gas. And so it'll be more than 11 minutes, but it would yeah. it'd be 11 minute reserve if I wanted to take it to zero. Does that make sense, guys? It's inherently yeah. conservative. Yes. Um, and generally when you're getting into bigger diving, you definitely want to start thinking Bigger reserves, more safety. Things happen. Catastrophic gas failures absolutely happen. And sometimes they don't happen to just you. They have sometimes they happen to your buddy. And if it happens to your buddy, you want to make sure. That you can uh, handle it right and, and uh, get it taken care of. Uh, that if you and Jim Bob go into a cave that you've accounted for the idea that if Jim Bob runs out of gas and you both have to go back, that you have enough gas for Jim Bob too. Make sense? Yep. All right. I think we've kind of beat that one down and it's gone a lot farther. Now the bad news or good news, I'm not sure which for, let's see, let's just move that for, let's see, Caleb, Chase, uh, Josh, Brian, Brian, Mike, you get out of this because you're not going to be diving with us on Saturday, unfortunately. You're welcome to, though. Uh, fly right out. Um, you can stay in one of our guest rooms. 
Um, I have two guest rooms at our house. Um, Wait, where is Mike? <laughs> You're already in town, doofus. <laughs> where, no, where does Mike live? <laughs> oh, Mike lives in Northern California. Whereabouts? Uh, Folsom area. I'm from Lake Tahoe. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's where I get my deep dives. <laughs> Sorry about that, Chase. I thought you were asking why. Where was your room to stay in? I'm like, you already have a room. I know where I am. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm more interested in the room in Florida. <laughs> absolutely, the room in Florida is absolutely open up to any any students that want to come out and uh, stay in in my guest room in Florida. So that is always an option. Um, so <laughs> um, the dive boats go out daily. Um, and usually there's at least two dive boats going out. Um, so um, usually morning, one morning and one in the afternoon. So you guys are welcome to that. You got to pay for the dive boat and, and your gas, but I'll get you a good deal on that too. So um, I've got a, a friends and family rate. <laughs> so that's not a problem. But the bad news for everybody taking my deep class on Saturday is I will expect that every one of you will know how many liters of gas are in the tanks, each of the tanks that you are going to be Toting along. I will also uh, on Friday have given you guys all three uh, or all three dive plans that we're going to do on Saturday. Okay. So based upon that, when you guys show up on Saturday morning, I will expect that you guys will be able to tell me if we can do those dives. Hmm. Now, David, do you want to give them the the uh, the secret evil plan? Because I know you've sat through this class before. Oh, are you going to be a panicky diver again? Oh no, I. Oh. No, no, I, I just will warn you that on occasion, um, I use a backwards pin for my dive planning, and uh, it doesn't always give a dive plan that you can do. So I'm just going to give you that warning right now. Um, what the hell does that mean? You want enough gas? It means protect your math and do your plan your dive and dive your plan. I'm not exactly. trusting your math. It right. means get a 149. Yeah. I trust my own math. Well, I also know that it's a it's a reverse uh, dive where we're getting deeper each dive. I'm going, but I'm going to give you guys a dive uh, three dive plans, and I will expect you guys to be able to go through and give me gas management of what can you do with the guy based upon your gas. Okay. And can I will also expect that you guys will check the the dive tables as well. Okay. So, um. But I can tell you that sometimes I use the wrong end of the pen when I'm creating my dive plans, and sometimes those dive plans don't add, and you will not have the resources to be able to do the dive that you think you can do. So, are you, please, are you doing reverse out. this weekend, Ben? Say again? Are you doing reverse this weekend? Yeah, we're going to do reverse. I need to see where everybody's at, and I need to uh, be comfortable. Before I can take everybody to the deepest deep, um, I'm going to uh, make sure that everybody's good. Sure. I do not like doing reverse profiles, but it's a, a new SSI thing. Um, and the way we're going to do it will we'll be safe, so I'm not worried about it. But I, it's still – I've just been diving too long It just and just had it in my head to do it the other way. So it, it's hard for me, but I'm going to do it. And we're going to do it, and we're going to do it great. So anyway, that's the moral story there. So let's jump into buoyancy. Who had Archimedes? That was me. All righty. Would you like to present Archimedes? I will do my best. All right. You have seven minutes on the clock. Go for it. All right. <laughs> uh, let's see. Screen. All right. Let me know if you guys can see this. Not yet. Uh, yes. All right. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. So I, I wasn't sure how to pronounce Archimedes. So I looked it up. We've got it spelled phonetically there for those of you who are like me and didn't know. But uh, what we're going to learn about today is really about this ancient mathematician who helped develop a way to figure out whether things will float. So why? Why is that important? Well, things like you know, shipbuilding, um, maybe aquatic equipment design, diving. Um, anyway, the first question I asked myself when I was looking at this is, 
who the hell is this guy? And like I said, he's an ancient Greek mathematician, physicist, engineer, astronomer, and an inventor. I don't think they had scuba back then, so I'm assuming he wasn't a diver. Uh, and based on the reading, he didn't sound super fun at parties. But he was one of the leading scientists in classical antiquity, and he, you know, developed things like, I don't know, Pi. You might have heard of that. Uh, he also uh, invented the um, the Archimedean spiral. I tried to figure out what that was, but let's just say it's important math stuff. Uh, and he cal anticipated calculus. And so he was one of the first to really apply mathematical to physical phenomenon, which is important for what we're learning today, such as the law of the lever, center of gravity, and the law of buoyancy or Archimedes principle. So his two volume study on floating bodies, it's two different books. Um, I read it today and, you know, really what it boils down to is he just basically says, <laughs> Object. Totally or partially immersed in a fluid is buoyed by a force equal to the weight of that fluid displaced by the object. So what does that mean for us? And what does it mean for this class? Um, well, he was, uh, I'll take one step back and just explain sort of the, the story behind it. He, um, there was a, a king hero of Syracuse and he was con contracted a goldsmith to make a, um, a, a crown in pure gold from a uh, boat of reef. And it was a very expensive thing that he, he had built. And he wanted to know if he was getting his money's worth. So he asked Archimedes uh, to figure out if he might have been cheated by the goldsmith. And he tasked this mathematician with determining if any other silver or anything was used. And like all great ideas, Archimedes had a stroke of genius in the bathtub. And uh, he had the stroke of genius when he sat in the bathtub and he noticed that the water was displaced. Uh, so he, as he sat in, it rised. So that gave him an idea about how he might calculate the volume of that crown. And so um, in, in a more relevant example, uh, he, he basically understood that the water would be displaced and it would submerge, any submerged object would displace, displace an amount equal to its own volume. So in this example here, you can see that this little bolt um, when put in water displaces about uh, 20 milliliters of water. So the volume of that bolt is 20 milliliters. And that's important when we start talking about things like buoyancy and uh, flotation and understanding things like density and weight. So um, by dividing the mass of the crown, he was able to understand um, the and looking at the volume of water displaced, he could understand if uh, cheaper or less dense metals had been added because uh, the density would be lower than gold. And he found out that that was actually the case. Um, and he proved that there had been some silver mix in. I'm pretty sure the goldsmith was executed, although I cannot confirm that. But uh, fun fact and safe diving practice, this is similar to how hydrostatic tests on scuba tanks are performed. They're dropped in water and the volume displacement, they added high pressure to that. And the volume of water displaced um, gives that, that's what the hydrostatic test does and make sure that your tank shrinks back and re, you know, that displaced water doesn't stay there. So what does this all mean for diving? We haven't really talked much about that. It's a fun story, but um, really want to bring it all together. He, uh, so using those same concepts is that he was in his experiment um, Archimedes came up with a mathematical formula that could help um, understand not only density and weight, but the relationship between those factors and how they result um, and whether or not something will sink or float. And that the formula is here. It's uh, it's two volume book boils down to this this formula, which is buoyancy or the buoyant force is um, multiple it equals uh, the volume of the object times the density of the liquid minus the weight of the object. Now. Can you tell me why, let's say this boat here uh, and this weight weigh exactly the same, but why this boat will float while this weight sinks based on what we know about this equation or buoyancy? Oh, I would say because a greater amount of water is being displaced by the boat than the size of the object. 
That's correct. Yes. They, the amount of water being displaced is significantly more with this boat um, than it is with, with this thing. You can see this, the key right here shows the, the volume of water displaced and that it's also important for, you know, ship design and development for um, making you know, ship holes. So why does all this matter to us? Well, let's get back to the diving example. Um, if we we can take Archimedes principle, and uh, I'll give you a clue on this one. Uh, you know, as divers are dealing with water, so the density of salt water is listed as 1.025 kilograms per liter, and the density of fresh water is one kilogram per liter. So if we use Archimedes principle, and we know that an object weighs 45 kilograms and has a volume of 80 liters placed in salt water, given Archimedes formula, will it float or will it sink? And I'll give you a hint. I'll put them up here. So can anyone do the math? Well, I'm going to make, make people do math. So will it float or sink? And what's the buoyancy? Anyone got it? So I'm coming up with a buoyancy uh, 37 for that, which if it's positive, I'm assuming would mean that this will float. That is correct. So 37 kilograms, and that's a positive number. So it floats. <laughs> All right. So we'll go back to uh, one more example. And uh, same Archimedes principle. This object weighs 146 kilograms, has a volume of 100 liters. But it's in fresh water. What will its buoyancy be? It's going to be negative 46. That is correct. And will it sink or float? It's going to sink. That is correct. It sinks. <laughs> So we still haven't actually talked about diving at all though. Um, so can anyone tell me why Archimedes principle is relevant or important for diving? Or in other words, what happens if you as a diver weigh more than the water you displace? Well, they're gonna sink, they're gonna be negatively buoyant. And what do we wanna be? Neutrally buoyant. That's right. So if you weigh more and you have too much weight, you're gonna be negatively buoyant, cause issues you know, with maybe trampling over vegetation or so so negatively buoyant that you can't get back to the surface um so all very i'll leave you guys with uh this interesting uh picture that i found and basically just shows the the weight of displaced water and talks a little bit about the uh, the buoyant effect does anyone have any questions this is archimedes in his bathtub <laughs> All right, any questions? That was Archimedes, the story. Oh, that was great. So I got, yeah, no, good job. That was a very yeah. good job, actually. I, yeah. I'm extremely impressed. Uh, that's probably the best Archimedes uh, um, presentation we've had. Um, in these classes. So very nicely done. Very nicely done as well. Um, I think that kind of skips I, my need to present at Archimedes because you did a, a good job. My only question for you is this. The person who ripped off Archimedes for the crown, what happened to him? I, I, I think he got executed. I can't confirm, but he, he ripped off a king. So I'm pretty sure he tried to got drown him, but he was fat, so he was positively buoyant and couldn't get him to go underwater. <laughs> <laughs> he was in charge of cleaning out Archimedes' hot tub from that for the rest of his life. <laughs> right. That was a very, that was a very good job. Uh, I'm extremely impressed. What do you guys think? Thumbs up, uh, thumbs down. For setting the bar so high, Mike. Uh, <laughs> much appreciated. Sarcastic. <laughs> Right on. I've got, we have, should have one more presentation tonight. I believe that is Mr. Brian. Yep. 
All righty. Whenever you're ready, Brian. All right. You're going to have to give me one second. I'm going to have to figure this out. Um, and also, just a forewarning, I was not able to make a uh, nice PowerPoint presentation like my day. Please bear with me. Mike, would you uh, email me your presentation? That was very good. I'd like to look look through that again. All right. Let me see if I... Nope, that's not it. All right. Uh, so I'm not super familiar with StreamYard. How can I put myself so you all can see me? Or is this fine right here? I don't want everybody to be staring at a small screen. Well, I can... I can uh, which, are you presenting a screen? Uh, no, I just didn't know if... There, that's so fine. you can kind of see me, I guess, a little bit bigger. All right. Um, yep. So, um, like it was said, uh, I'll be doing Dalton's Law as well as Henry's Law. Um, and so this one's dealing a little bit more with gases. So you could say, yes, this is a gas. Um, but so I'll go right off and start with Henry's Law. Uh, so for that, I have your standard issue, Dr. Pepper Cherry, zero sugar. Uh, don't mind the zero sugar. But uh, basically what this is talking about here with Henry's Law, um, we're talking about dissolved gas. So as most of you probably know, uh, what makes drinks carbonated is that you have a dissolved gas to it, carbon dioxide. Uh, so what Henry's Law talks about is saying that the amount of gas that will dissolve in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas, given that you don't agitate it and that the temperature stays constant. Uh, so yeah, obviously agitating it is going to affect it a little bit. Uh, but basically what the, what Henry's law says is that when you have a higher partial pressure or just the pressure in general, it will tend to force a gas into solution more. Um, so how does this apply to diving? Uh, basically, as I'm, uh, you know, descend in depth and we're breathing in compressed air, we're going to be breathing it at a higher partial pressure. Mm -hmm. What that's going to do do is using those gases to go into solution, our solution of our bodies. Uh, when we come back up, come on, those gases will tend to come out of solution, and I'm glad this didn't spill me. But um, yeah, so uh, that's the concern is that those gases coming out of solution, if they come out too fast, that's what we call the bends, that is the actual gas bubbles forming within our bloodstream without giving them a chance to come out, which is why if you shake up a soda, really don't open it fast. Um, where this comes more into play and what we care about is uh, we talk about the, get my terms right, it's the uh, profusion and diffusion of nitrogen. Um, hmm. As we breathe nitrogen at a higher partial pressure, more is going to diffuse, or excuse me, profuse into our bodies um depending on the type of tissue uh again we had talked about fast tissues and slow tissues um all talking about i guess you could say speed or the concentration with which gas will go into our bloodstream um a fast tissue it will faster but will also diffuse out faster whereas a slow tissue will take longer to profuse in but will also take longer to diffuse out um, and mm -hmm. that's why we care about it coming up um, is that any gases that we have in our slow tissues will take longer to come out. And that's why we can't ascend as fast as we descend, especially if we go to a depth where we're dealing with larger partial pressures. Um, does anybody have any questions on that so far? No. Makes sense. Okay. Um, Yep, so uh, then I'm going to transition that over um, since I talked about partial pressures and talked about Dalton's Law. Um, I don't have as good of a training aid, um, seeing as there's really kind of only one gas that is dissolved in here. But <laughs> what Dalton's Law talks about is when you have uh, multiple gases uh, present in the mixture like you would see in a scuba tank, um, that the pressure exerted by each gas will be effectively equal to the fraction that it um of that or the excuse me what i try is the percent composition of that gas um and overall will equal the total pressure so put a little bit better the 
sum of the partial pressures of all the gases in your mixture will equal the total pressure of that mixture. Uh, where this comes into effect, um, as Ben talked about in our last class, was when we were determining our best mix uh, specifically for nitrox. Um, as we are going, as we start descending in depth and we start adding atmospheres, our partial pressures add up, right? When we're at the surface, uh, oxygen has a partial pressure of 0.21 and nitrogen has a partial pressure of 0.79. Uh, when we descend down to 33 feet or another atmosphere, now that has doubled to 1.58 for nitrogen and 0.42 for oxygen. Mm -hmm. Um, Yep. And so as we continue to go down, that will increase in that same way. Uh, likewise, if we were diving a mixture of nitrox that had, say, a higher percentage of oxygen, lower percentage of nitrogen, that will increase the same way. Why we care is because of a couple different things. Um, the main one being nitrogen narcosis. As we talked uh, at right around, I believe it was 2.37. Um, that's when nitrogen starts having a narcotic effect. So if breathing air get well so i can ask you guys that um if we're just breathing regular air 79 and 21 percent oxygen uh, at about what depth does nitrogen start becoming narcotic hmm. anyone Can you repeat that, Brian? Yep. So um, knowing that we have uh, nitrogen becoming narcotic at its uh, partial pressure of 2.37, and that we're breathing air, air mixture of 21% oxygen, 79% nitrogen, at what depth will we feel pressure? And if so at what depth will nitrogen become narcotic? Does that kind of answer your question, or is that still a little unclear? Nope, nope, that's perfect. Nope. Hang on. Okay. 0.37 divided by 0 0.79. That's going to be uh, 99 feet, or no, sorry, greater than 60 feet. That's going to be three atmospheres worth of pressure. So it starts to become narcotic at about 66 feet. Yep. And so, um, you know, kind of relating that back to those of us that did our open water course, right? That's why we were certified down to about 60 feet, is that we are not likely to see the effects of nitrogen narcosis. Again, it does affect everybody differently, but um, in general, it will not become narcotic until below that. So you are relatively safer as just an open water diver. But should you plan to go deeper like those of us doing the deep water diving uh, course, then we do have to have more caution whenever we start talking about nitrogen narcosis. Hmm. Um, on the same token, when we start talking about diving nitrox with higher percentages of oxygen, um, when we start building up that oxygen part, we do run the risk of running into oxygen toxicity. Um, with that, a partial pressure at 1.4 is what they have said is kind of the, uh, I don't want to call it an administrative threshold, but effectively, if you stay there, you will, um, the risks are as acceptable as they can be. Uh, should you go up to 1.6, uh, that is the absolute limit. You should not touch that, um, except for, as Ben said, uh, when you're doing a, uh, I believe it was an emergency decompression, sorry, an accelerated decompression. Um, so depending on the oxygen that you have in your nitrox, that will determine how deep you can safely go. Um, so I could ask the same question again. For those certified in nitrox, we could go all, or up to nitrox too, we can go up to uh, or 40 percent nitrox mixture with that being right 40 percent oxygen so if we wanted to maintain our 1.4 partial pressure oxygen limit how deep could we go what was that percentage of uh, oxygen again uh that was a 40 percent oxygen mixture 80 something feet. What is that? That's 1.4 divided by 0.4 minus 1 do, 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 times 33. 
That's 82 and a half feet. Yep, it's right, right around 82 to 83 feet. Um, and so uh, I won't go into too much detail because this is supposed to be somewhat condensed, but depending on the mixture that you have, you can dive deeper, but should you choose to dive that high of a mix of nitrox, you cannot actually dive as deep without violating that administrative limit. Um, so, uh, and again, getting to the more technical side of things, um, obviously I don't know that much about it, but uh, should you start mixing other gases in there, such as helium, um, and I believe that was the only one that we mixed in, that same rule for Dalton's Law still applies, is that all it's self-exerted and uh then i don't know they haven't really i can't remember if you said if there was any bad effects from having too much helium in there but i think with the levels that we would have in there uh too much helium would deprive you of oxygen correct no not at all it, the interesting part about it is, is you mix in the partial pressure of oxygen you have to remember the, the key levels of uh, at 0 0.10, partial pressure of oxygen um, is when you die. 0 0.16 is where you start losing consciousness. Uh, the body needs um, at least 0.19 to 0.21 uh, in order for a normal operations to persist. So interestingly enough, if you get start getting into some super deep dives, like you're doing a 100 meter dive, for example, uh, you may have a surface uh, partial pressure of oxygen of 3% uh, oxygen and 80% helium with the rest being nitrogen. Um, now the catch is, is you can't breathe that on the surface. Um, that is a bottom gas only. So in that type of technical diving, what will end up happening is you'll have a travel gas, a, a gas to get you to a certain depth. And you may actually, in that case, you actually may end up with two travel gases. Um, travel gas number one, travel gas number two um, to get you to that point. And then you have your bottom gas. And then you'll use your travel gases again to start heading uh, back up for their safety. And you, uh, you'll you most likely, a big dive like that, you'll most likely have multiple levels of decompression gases. Um, so you'll, you'll probably start off with a 60% uh, a blend um, to get a uh, blend of oxygen. And then you'll probably have an 80%, a 90%, and a 100% if you're doing a big dive like that. The most deco blends I've ever used are two different deco blends. And I typically use 55, 60, 55% or 60% for my first. And then ninety percent or hundred percent for my second, and that's been sufficient for the types of dives that I've done. But you got to remember, I'm using those on uh, fifty or eighty cubic foot tanks, and so a fifty cubic foot tank fill uh, for a deco blend um, at sixty five percent, I'm going to be using that at uh, 45, 50 feet um, at that point. Um, how long could I get out of that? A long freaking time. That's a good hours worth of deco and then i'm coming up to my higher stop at um on another 80 foot cubic foot tank of 100 that gives me two hours on 100 percent, and i could use it 20 feet so it's you know you have to think about those kind of things but um that was kind of a longer answer than what you asked for but i apologize but uh and the partial pressure la laws of auction don't don't stop right the idea is, is that you have to have at least uh, nine, uh 19 percent for normal operations of auction so you could have the, the rest could be helium. You could have it as heliotrox. Um, interesting uh, trivia for you guys. They, they did a, um, a study. They were, there's a problem in deep diving where they were diving in heliotrox, and it's called high pressure uh, nervous disorder, right? And it's interesting enough. They figured the how you get rid of high pressure nervous disorder is you leave enough nitrogen in the mix to allow the diver to get slightly narked just just slightly and the idea is, is the, the nitrogen soothes the nerves right it doesn't um gives them a um, relaxing effects and allows the nervous the nervous system to relax a little bit whereas if you do a heliotrox too deep the problem is is the nerves get too much pressure on them and they go into a nervous tick um and spasm as well as into a, a full uh into full features. so there's in diving, uh, if you're going to do, if you're doing deep diving, you always leave some nitrogen in the in the mix. You never um, heliotrox is not uh, designed or good for deep diving. It's it's good for shallow diving. Um, I know a bunch of divers that do heliotrox for uh, long nine foot dives, long eighty foot dives, long hundred foot dives. But um, I've and I've I've heard of it up, up to one hundred and thirty feet. But typically, you're not going to use heliotrox on anything past one hundred hundred and thirty feet. Um, you want to use Trimix after and for anything long after 130 feet. So, too much information. Sorry, guys. 
but uh, Brian, you did a good job. I think I feel like you've got a good understanding um, of the subject matter, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to have all the rest of the presentations on our next. So those of you who have not presented, you know where the bar is. Mike obviously set that and did a fantastic job, and he's yep. going to send me his, his uh, presentation um, when he gets a chance because I'm excited. That was a good one. I, I appreciate that. Um, I've got our final uh, thoughts and, and uh, questions of the day, and I'm going to start with um, Caleb. Caleb, for every foot of depth in freshwater, pressure increases by? Every foot of depth. Yeah. <clears throat> numbers I asked you guys point, to attach. Point one four seven. Nope, there's two numbers I asked you guys to memorize. Eight six four. Oh. Yep, point four three two. Yeah, for for fresh water. Fresh water exerts point four. You know, I can't tell you guys enough. There's two numbers that you need to tattoo on your wrist, on your eyelid, something. Point four four five is is salt water. Point four three two is fresh water. Uh, these, who's done? Who's finished all the science of diving online homework? Yeah, have, you, have you had a chance? I have. I think two thirds of it. Okay, Mike's at two thirds. Um, Josh, I know you finished it because that's your time you roll. Brian, have you finished it? Yes, I have. Cool. Chase? I have not Chase? finished yet. Wow. I, I would have I would have put you on the other side of that coin. So, it's been a very busy week of work for me. <laughs> but Okay. If you guys could, before our next class, if you guys could finish that up. There is a final exam, um, and I've given you guys enough information through this that you should be able to pass the final exam, but make sure you guys memorize those two numbers. They show up a lot. Uh, 0.445 and 0.432. 0.445 is your pressure change for seawater because of the weight. 0.432 is your pressure change for freshwater. The way I remember it is 4.32 is sequential. Count down four, three, two. Look for the sequential number. Salt water is just slightly more condensed than that, so four, four, five is going to be salt water. You got four forty-fives. Yep. So there you go. And if you guys are absolutely <laughs> terrible at remembering like I am, you can always just punch it into the calculator. Fourteen point seven psi per atmosphere divided by however many feet are in an atmosphere. <laughs> okay. So anyway, four, three, two. I want you to memorize. Okay. Next question. Let's just jump through the start. I'm get a little, a little uh, punch drunk here. Um, the this one's for Chase. The greatest expansion of compression per foot happens in which depth area? It's going to be delta the first thirty three feet where the contraction happens by half. Exactly. That's a great answer. All right, Brian, which physical law states, if temperature remains constant, the pressure and volume of any gas are inversely, inversely related? So that is going to be Boyle's law. See? It is Boyle's law. Ding, ding, ding. All right. So Joshua, the absolute pressure at a depth of 165 feet in salt water is... Six. Six is exactly right. And hopefully you didn't just see the answers that I left on the, uh, I'm deleting those. So that they're no, I didn't, but I knew the answer from doing the test and the homework. Oh, okay. there you go. I did, I did punch into the calculator for you. So there you go. Perfect. All right. Uh, let's see, Mike, breathing gas consumption. What? Increases as depth increases. Absolutely. Why? Is the pressure exactly all right back to caleb what is the surface air consumption rate of a diver with a 3000 psi rated 80 cubic foot cylinder who uses 650 psi in 10 minutes at a depth of 33 feet in the ocean i hate this question but it's in your homework so i have to at least ask it 
That is it's pretty simple if you when you look at it. Yeah. So it'd be thirty-two point five. Thirty-two point five. Uh, would you like to how you came up with that answer? Um, uh, six hundred and fifty divided by ten, and then divide by two because it's one atmosphere, or it's at two atmospheres. So I take it back to one atmosphere. There you go. Good job. All right, Chase. I believe you're next. A diver and his or her equipment weigh 175 pounds, and they are neutrally buoyant in salt water. To be neutrally buoyant in fresh water. Diving with the same equipment he or she, or they, I guess, has to see remove weight. Yep. Why? Because salt water is more dense than fresh water. So to account for that, you'd have to remove weight. Exactly. Good job. All right. Brian, a 0.1 cubic foot of air is needed in your buoyancy compensator to maintain neutral buoyancy at 30 feet in the ocean. What will happen to your buoyancy if you ascend 10 feet without deflating? So if you were to ascend that 10 feet, then, yeah, let's see, that would be four. Your positive buoyancy will increase because at a lower pressure, you will have an expansion of volume, which will make you more positively buoyant. There you go. That's exactly right. Okay. Let's see. Joshua. At an altitude of 16,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure is approximately? Twice. <clears throat> or, sorry, half. There oh, you, go. There you <laughs> go. Thank you. You want to give me an understanding of why? Um, yeah, as you, as you increase your altitude, the, uh, you have less atmosphere above you. So you have about half of the same atmosphere at sea level. Exactly. All right. Mike. <laughs> I'm going to skip this question because I've got the answer on it there. How much breathing gas? <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? All right. Let's see. So it's 58. Yeah. So I'm going to give you this one instead. If the volume of gas is kept constant, what varies directly with temperature, Mike? Volume. Oh, go. sorry pressure yeah there you go sorry all right caleb the partial pressure dalton requires the sum of the partial pressures to always be equal with which pressure requires the sum of the partial pressures to always be equal with the absolute pressure absolute pressure is exactly right and finally I, again, I have the answer there. So I, I feel strongly you guys have the, this one as well. So I'm not too terribly worried. Uh, if you guys have the math down and you're good to go. All right. I'm going to call it the end here um, and we'll just go through a brief review. Um, on our next class, we're going to be talking about energy and underwater light refraction, diffusion, turbidity, um, sound, heat, conduction, convection, and radiation. I've got videos. I've got slides. I've got all kinds of cool stuff. And we're also going to get into Bowman. Bowman is my favorite. I love Bowman. Um, he was a stud in my mind. But uh, anyway, so today we went over a lot of the idea of um, how um, Pascal's law affects us. Um, we got to see the uh, um, the idea of the ideal gas law in action because of uh, Pascal's principle and how it affected buoyancy. Um, we talked about that, and we talked in depth about Pascal and how it affects us. We talked about gas management and the difference in tanks as well. How, to out how many liters of actual usable gas are in the tank. And I, I put out a challenge that I want you guys to all take a cylinder and go home and figure out what your actual honest-to-goodness sack rate is going to be. Um, once you understand that, uh, I gave you guys a formula on how to actually figure out your honest to goodness sack rate for a dive and it will give you at least a reasonable base number that you can start cal calculating out and refine as time goes by and then at towards the end we had a fantastic presentation from mike on buoyancy and then we reviewed dalton and henry um 
in uh, with a great presentation from Brian. So, Brian, what's the most interesting thing you learned about Dalton or Henry's Law? Um, so, I guess the most interesting thing was just talking about the profusion and the diffusion of it. Um, is that, you know, I it makes sense, but I guess I never really thought of it as um, – of it having a gradient, but that, you know, if you were to go extremely deep or get there extremely fast, that you would actually have such a huge inrush or outrush. Um, and that's, you know, actually what would cause any sort of damage. There you go. Perfect. And Mike, what's the most interesting thing you learned about our good friend Archimedes? Um, well, Obviously, the buoyancy stuff was very interesting. I just thought it was interesting reading about all the stuff that he did. Um, but as it relates to this class specifically, um, I think the most interesting thing is that he came up with a way to um, measure the buoyancy. Cool. Well, right on, guys. Well, perfect. You guys have done a great job. What do you think of the class so far? Are we doing OK? Yeah, I like it. Good. Good. That's my overall goal. Hopefully that you guys learn something and get something usable out of this. Um, I will tell you that uh, this is definitely a, a much higher level class than I, uh, for science of diving than I normally normally teach. Um, so you got, because you guys are so locked on, um, you guys are doing a fantastic job. It's it's unusual to have this this high level of si for science of diving. Um, I definitely absolutely. understand why pursue tech diving more. Well, the, that's the good news is, is um, I do have a tech diving class coming up. I have one slot left in it. Um, the first, uh, I generally try and keep my class size at three, um, but I will go up to four. Um, so if somebody is terribly interested in that, the only challenge is, is I only have um, one extra setup for tech um, uh, in twin sets. And actually, I take that back. I do have two, but it'd be a pain in the butt to do that over the course of two days. Cause I only have two sets of twins. Um, so my, my extra tech setup is being utilized. So if somebody wanted to be in that, they they're going to need to get side mount certified and get some dives in really, really fast. But we do have our next tech class coming up um, as well. And if you're interested in tech as well, um, be aware that I do have all the tech classes online for my last XR class. Um, so you're welcome to go through those. It's, I think there's uh, four of them or five of them. I don't remember how many we had, but there's four or five of them, and they it gets pretty in the weeds, that's for sure. So well, let's I see. I'm going to make your next class, but I'll come hunt you down in Florida when I'm ready. There you go, perfect. It looks like our next class will be on October 6th, yep. so that should give you guys plenty of time to uh, study and have all the book work done prior to class. Um, the good news is, is um, we only have one more really big tough one to get through. Um, M values is, um, a big one to get through, um, and understand, uh, um, uh, decompression theory. The rest of it's pretty, pretty interesting. And, and, uh, it's not as in the weeds. We're going to go through, um, a, uh, an hour or at least of dive maladies. Um, I like dive maladies. I think they're pretty interesting. Um, and, uh, we'll go through, uh, toxicities as well. So, that one kind of gets a little bit in the weeds, but um, the only really um, deep in the weeds um, that we have left is um, uh, theory, uh, is uh, decompression theory. The rest of it's pretty straightforward. So, um, and uh, the, uh, is to go through. So, you guys are doing great. Um, this is really, truthfully, more of an intro to tech than it is a science of diving. So, because because of the quality of you guys, not because of me. So. So, uh, and I think David will tell you that, and Josh or David will tell you that the last science of diving class wasn't nearly this in depth because of the, the students we had. Would you say that's fair, David? Absolutely. Absolutely. So good job, guys. Any questions you guys have? Are we going to talk about other algorithms, Ben, or just uh, Bullman? Well, I only discuss Bullman. I'm, I am not a fan of RGBM um, in any way, shape, or form. <coughs> Um, and so I just, I don't even, um, I, we can certainly discuss it briefly, but it's just not, um, and I don't like BGBM as well. Um, well I, I, will you at least share with us why you're not a fan of them? So we, in the future have a better understanding of why Bowman might be preferential. 
Um, yeah, when we get get to that point, we'll certainly we can certainly get into it. Uh, I can just tell you, uh, for me, it's a more accurate algorithm that gives you better information of where the M value is. Um, and it doesn't uh, skew data throughout the dive. It's consistent th as you go through the process. Um, RGBM is a very conservative model. And while it'll give you a fair amount at the beginning of a dive week, it will screw you at the end of the dive week. Um, you will <laughs> you'll have no dive time left at the end of a dive week. It, it's not very friendly when it comes to repetitive dives. Um, because they've just taken it to the nth degree of safety. Um, and yes, they have the least amount of bent divers on it, but it also, you know, you can't get bent if you don't dive, right? So no. there's only so far you usually should take safety, right? And, and if you go back and look at their their study data of, that they're looking at of the people who got bent is because they were, they should have known better um, and they were doing dumb things really is what it came down to. So as long as you follow Bullman and you apply appropriate safety, for example, if you're diving cold, slow down, take more safety stops. Um, you know, don't take the risk. If you don't need to take the risk, don't take the risk, right? And the people who use it the are the, the people who, they're, they're trying to break down. That's what they get so, RGBM is just very, a lot less forgiving when it comes to breaking it. It, it doesn't, if you break it, you're screwed. You, it just... It doesn't work anymore. Okay. So that's the biggest reason. Bullman is the most um, broad scope. And as long as you follow it, you're good. So, and I can teach, and we'll talk about grading factors of why uh, and how you can add that additional safety factor. And I can tell you, I absolutely work with my safety factor. If I'm doing a really big dive, if I'm doing a trimix where, where I'm out and doing a, a 220 um, on trimix, I can absolutely tell you that I do not run a 5085 period. Do not. Um, do do? I run a 4570 uh, um, or 4575. Um, is it typical? Sometimes I'll run a 5075, um, but I'll pull my my uh, GF high down at least 5 to 10% uh, to give myself additional safety margin as well. So, Do you I pull your load down too? Say again? Do you pull your load down too? Sometimes. I'll pull it down a little bit. Um, I won't pull it. Usually the most I'll ever do is 5% on my low. Uh, because remember, your um, the bigger factor is your grading factor high, not your grading factor low. Um, overall, as you look at it, uh, okay. grading factor low just helps reduce the speed. It's kind of like a parachute, right, um, on a dragster. It doesn't stop the dragster, but it slows it down. Okay. So we got to get in the pits. It's The biggest issue is not slowing the dragster though is, is stopping and how fast do you want to stop that and and what's the safety margin in stopping the dragster right that's the way to think about a gradient factor is uh, the gradient factor low is is the first parachute gradient factor um high is the brakes okay so that's that's probably a, a really great analogy for it so okay easy enough all right guys any more questions all right mm -hmm. as you know if you um, if you do have questions don't be afraid to reach out um, I will see most of you on Friday. Uh, Mike, you are more than welcome to to sit in on the deep dive class if you'd like. Um, I, it's on Friday at 7 o'clock, I believe. Yep, 7 o'clock. You're welcome sure. to sit in. Absolutely. Yeah, if I can do it. Um, yeah. I'm going to send you that material for Archimedes. Will you send me those dive plans too? I just wanted to run those on my own. Like, I'm not going to be diving, obviously, but would love to. For see. Saturday? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll send you the worst case scenario, I'll send you the dive plans. And then uh, um, on uh, Friday, I will also send everybody the Excel spreadsheet as well um, with all the tags in it, as well as the, uh, um, because at that point, I'll have had a chance to explain how my uh, my massive uh, um, uh, spreadsheet works. So you'll have a little bit deeper understanding. So it's one that I created. It's mine. It's mine only. Um, so I just ask that you don't share it with any uh, anybody outside. Um, you know, the, I don't want to take the liability for that. I'm not, um, for you guys, it's just a nice, it's a cheat sheet is what it really is. I like cheat sheets. So easy enough. Cool. Any more questions? Cool beans. All right. See you guys Friday and possibly next Friday. So great. Thank you everybody. Bye guys. See ya.